6. After school the next day, I joined the swarm of people filing out through the overstuffed hallways of WRHS and made my way to Harold. I had to change the band aid, which took a few minutes, but I preferred to let the traffic thin out a bit before driving home anyway. To kill time, I texted Daisy, asking her to meet me at Applebee's, our go to restaurant for studying together. She responded a few minutes later. I have work until 8. Meet you after? Me. Do you need a ride? Her. Dad picked me up. He's taking me. Has Davis texted? Me. No. Should I text him? Her. Absolutely not. Her. Wait between 24 and 30 hours. Obviously. You're intrigued but not obsessed. Me. Got it. I didn't know there were texting commandments. Her. Well there are. We're almost there so I gotta go. First order of business, drawing straws to see who has to get in the Chucky costume. Pray for me. Harold and I started our drive home, but then it occurred to me that I could go anywhere. Not anywhere, I guess, but nearly. I could drive to Ohio, if I wanted, or Kentucky, and still be home before curfew. Thanks to Harold, a couple hundred square miles of the American Midwest were mine for the taking. So instead of turning to go home, I kept driving north up Meridian Street until I merged onto I-465. I turned the radio up as a song I liked called can't stop thinking about you, came on. The bass sizzling in Harold's long-blown speakers, the lyrics stupid and silly and everything I needed. Sometimes you happen across a brilliant run of radio songs, where each time one station goes to commercial, you scan to another that has just started to play a song you love but had almost forgotten about, a song you never would have picked but that turns out to be perfect for shouting along to. And so I drove along to one of those miraculous playlists, headed nowhere. I followed the highway east, and then south, then west, then north, and then east again, until I ended up at the same Meridian Street exit where I'd started. The journey around Indianapolis cost about $7 in gas, and I knew it was wasteful, but I felt so much better after circling the city. When I parked in the driveway to open up the garage door, I saw I had a series of texts from Daisy. I just drew the short straw so I have to get inside the fricking Chucky costume. See you later if I survive. If I die weep at my grave every day until a seedling appears in the dirt, then cry on it to make it grow until it becomes a beautiful tree whose roots surround my body. They're making me go now they're taking away my phone remember me h-o-l-m-e-s-y. Update. I survived. Getting a ride to Applebee's after work. See you. In the living room, mom was grading quizzes with her feet up on the coffee table. I sat down next to her, and without looking up, she said, a Lyle from the Pickett estate brought over our canoe today, repaired. Said you and Daisy were paddling down the White River and hit a rock. Yeah, I said. You and Daisy, she said. Paddling on the White River. Yeah, I said. She looked up at last. Seems like something you would only do if, say, you wanted to run into Davis Pickett. I shrugged. Did it work? She asked. I shrugged again, but she kept looking at me until I gave in and spoke. I was just thinking about him. Wanted an excuse to check on him, I guess. How is he doing, without his father? I think he's okay, I said. Most people don't seem to like their dads much. She leaned into me, her shoulder against mine. 
I knew we were both thinking about my dad, but we had never been good at talking about him. I wonder if you would have clashed with your father. I didn't say anything. He would have understood you, that's for sure. He got your wise in a way I never could. But he was such a worrier, and you might have found that exhausting. I know I did, sometimes. You worry, too, I said. I suppose. Mostly about you. I don't mind worriers, I said. Worrying is the correct worldview. Life is worrisome. You sound just like him. She smiled a little. I still can't believe he left us. She said it like it was a decision, like he'd been mowing the lawn that day and thought, I think I'll fall down dead now. I cooked dinner that night, a macaroni scramble with canned vegetables, boxed macaroni, and some proper cheddar cheese, and then we ate while watching a reality show about regular people trying to survive in the wild. My phone finally buzzed while mom and I were doing the dishes, Daisy telling me she'd arrived at Applebee's, so I told mom I'd be back by midnight and reunited with Harold, who was, as always, a pure delight. Applebee's is a chain of mid-quality restaurants serving American food, which essentially means that everything features cheese. Last year, some kid had showed up on our doorstep and talked my mom into buying a huge coupon book to support his Boy Scout troop or something, and the book turned out to include 60 Applebee's coupons offering two burgers for $11. Daisy and I had been working our way through them ever since. She was waiting for me at a booth, changed out of her work shirt and into a scoop neck turquoise top, staring into the depths of her phone. Daisy didn't have a computer, so she did everything on her phone, from texting to writing fan fiction. She could type on it faster than I could on a regular keyboard. Have you ever gotten a dick pic? She asked in lieu of saying hello. Um, I've seen one, I said, scooting into the bench across from her. Well, of course you see one, Holmesy. Christ, I'm not asking if you're a 17th century nun. I mean have you ever received an unsolicited, no context dick pic? Like, a dick pic as a form of introduction. Not really, I said. Look at this, she said, and handed me her phone. Yeah, that's a penis, I said, squinting and turning it slightly counterclockwise. Right, but can we talk about it for a minute? Can we please not? I dropped the phone as Holly, our server, appeared at the table. Holly was our server quite regularly, and she wasn't exactly a card-carrying member of the Daisy and Holmesy fan club, possibly on account of our coupon-driven Applebee's strategy and limited resources for tipping. Daisy spoke up, as she always did. Holly, have you ever received? Nope, I said. No, no, no. I looked up at Holly. I just like a water with no food please, but around 9.45 I'll take a veggie burger, no mayonnaise no condiments at all, just a veggie burger and bun in a to-go box please. With fries. And you'll have the blazon Texan burger? Holly asked Daisy. With a glass of red wine, please? Holly just stared at her. Fine. Water. I assume y'all have a coupon? Holly asked. As it happens, we do, I said, and slid it across the table to her. Holly had hardly turned away when Daisy started back up. I mean, how am I supposed to react to a semi-erect penis as fan mail? Am I supposed to feel intrigued? He probably thinks it'll end in marriage. 
You'll meet IRL and fall in love and someday tell your kids that it all started with a picture of a disembodied penis. It's just such an odd response to my fiction. Like, okay, follow the thread of thoughts with me. I really enjoyed this story about Rey and Chewbacca's romantic adventure scavenging a wrecked Tulga spaceship on Endor in search of the famed Tulga Patience Potion. As a thank you, I believe I will send the author of that story a photograph of my dick. How do you get from A to B, Holmesy? Boys are gross, I said. Everyone is gross. People and their gross bodies, it all makes me want to barf. Probably just some loser Kylo Stan, she mumbled. I had no understanding of her fan fiction language. Please can we talk about something else? Fine. During my break at work, I became an expert in wills. So, get this. You can't actually leave any money to a non-human animal when you die but you can leave all your money to a corporation that exists solely to benefit a non-human animal. Basically, the state of Indiana doesn't consider pets people, but it does consider corporations people. So Pickett's money would all go to a company that benefits the Tuatara. And it turns out you don't have to leave your kids anything when you die. No matter how rich you are, not a house, not college money, nothing. What happens if their dad goes to prison? They'd get a guardian. Maybe the house manager or a family member or something, and that person would get money to pay the kids' expenses. If finding fugitives doesn't work out for me as a career, I might get into guardianship of billionaire children. Okay. You start putting together background files on the case and the Pickett family. I'm gonna get the police report and also do my calc homework, because there are only so many hours in a day and I have to spend too many of them at Chuck E. Cheese. How are you going to get a copy of the police report, anyway? Oh, you know. Wiles, she said. I happened to be friends with Davis Pickett on Facebook, and while his profile was a long-abandoned ghost town, it did provide me with one of his usernames, Dolgoodman, which led to an Instagram. The Instagram contained no real pictures, only quotes rendered in typewritery fonts with soft-focused, crumpled paper backgrounds. The first one, posted two years ago, was from Charlotte Bronte. I care for myself. The more solitary, the more friendless, the more unsustained I am, the more I will respect myself. The most recent quote was, He who doesn't fear death dies only once, which I thought was maybe some veiled reference to his father, but I couldn't unpack it. For the record, he who does fear death also dies only once, but whatever. Scrolling through the quotes, I noticed a few users who consistently liked Davis's posts, including one, Annie Bell Cheers, whose feed was mostly cheerleading pictures until I scrolled back more than a year and found a series of pictures of her with Davis, featuring a lot of heart emojis. Their relationship seemed to have started the summer between 9th and 10th grades and lasted a few months. Her Instagram profile had a link to her Twitter, where she was still following a user named Nicogniato, which turned out to be Davis's Twitter handle. I knew because he'd posted a picture of his brother doing a cannonball into their pool. The Nicogniato username led me to a YouTube profile. The user seemed to like mostly basketball highlights and those really long videos where you watch someone play a video game, and then eventually, after scrolling through many pages of search results, to a blog. At first, I couldn't tell for sure if the blog was Davis's. Each post began with a quote and then featured a short little paragraph that was never quite autobiographical enough to place him, like this one. At some point in life the world's beauty becomes enough. You don't need to photograph, paint or even remember it. It is enough. Tony Morrison
Last night I lay on the frozen ground, staring up at a clear sky only somewhat ruined by light pollution and the fog produced by my own breath. No telescope or anything. Just me and the wide open sky. And I kept thinking about how sky is a singular noun, as if it's one thing. But the sky isn't one thing. The sky is everything. And last night, it was enough. I didn't know for sure that it was him until I started to notice that many of the quotes from his Instagram feed were also used in the blog, including the Charlotte Bronte one. I care for myself. Charlotte Bronte. At the end, when walking was work, we sat on a bench looking down at the river, which was running low, and she told me that beauty was mostly a matter of attention. The river is beautiful because you are looking at it, she said. Another, written the previous November, around the time he and Annie Bell Cheers stopped replying to each other on Twitter. By convention hot, by convention cold, by convention color, but in reality atoms and void. Democritus When observation fails to align with a truth, what do you trust? your senses or your truth. The Greeks didn't even have a word for blue. The color didn't exist to them. Couldn't see it without a word for it. I think about her all the time. My stomach flips when I see her. But is it love, or just something we don't have a word for? The next one stopped me cold. The greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. William James I don't know what superpower William James enjoyed, but first can no more choose my thoughts than choose my name. The way he talked about thoughts was the way I experienced them, not as a choice but as a destiny. Not a catalog of my consciousness, but a refutation of it. When I was little, I used to tell mom about my invasives, and she would always say, just don't think about that stuff, Aza. But Davis got it. You can't choose. That's the problem. The other interesting thing about Davis's online presence was that everything ceased the day his father went missing. He'd posted on the blog almost every day for more than two years. And then on the afternoon after his dad disappeared, he wrote. Sleep tight, ya morons. J.D. Salinger. I think this is goodbye, my friends. Although, then again, no one ever says goodbye unless they want to see you again. It made sense. People had probably started snooping around. I mean, if I could find his secret blog. I imagine the cops could, too. But I wondered whether Davis had really quit the internet entirely, or whether he just decamped to some farther shore. I couldn't pick his trail back up, though. Instead, I got stuck searching his usernames and variants of them, and ended up meeting a lot of people who weren't my Davis Pickett. The 53-year-old Dave Pickett who was a truck driver in Wisconsin. The Davis Pickett who died of ALS after years of posting short blog entries written with the help of eye tracking software. A Twitter user named Dahl Goodman whose blog was nothing but vitriolic threats directed at members of Congress. I found a Reddit account that commented on Butler basketball and so probably belonged to Davis, but that, too, had been silent since Pickett Sr.'s disappearance. I'm very close, Daisy said suddenly. Very, very close. If only I were as good at life as I am at the internet. I looked up, returning to the sensorial plane of Applebee's. Daisy was tapping at her phone with one hand while holding her cup of water with the other. Everything was loud and bright. At the bar, people were shouting about some sports occurrence. What have you got? She asked me as she put down her water. Um, Davis had a girlfriend, but they broke up last November-ish. He has a blog, but hasn't updated anything since his dad disappeared. 
I don't know. In the blog, he seems sweet, I guess. Well, I'm glad you've used your internet detective skills to determine that Davis is sweet. Holmesy, I love you, but find some info on the case. So I did. The Indianapolis Star wrote about Russell Pickett a lot because his company was one of Indiana's biggest employers, but also because he was constantly getting sued. He had some huge real estate deal downtown that devolved into multiple lawsuits. His former executive assistant and Pickett Engineering's chief marketing officer had both sued him for sexual harassment. He'd been sued by a gardener on his estate for violating the Americans with Disabilities Act. The list went on and on. In all those articles, the same lawyer was quoted, Simon Morris. Morris's website described his company as a boutique law firm focusing on the comprehensive needs of high net worth individuals. Can I get a charge off your computer by the way? She actually said the letters BTW, which I wanted to point out required more syllables than just saying, by the way, but she was clearly locked into something. Without ever taking her eyes from her phone, Daisy reached into her purse pulled out a USB cable, and handed it to me. I plugged it into my laptop, and she just mumbled, that's better, thanks, I'm really close here. I noticed Holly had come with my to-go order. I cracked the plastic container and grabbed a couple fries before returning to my investigation of Pickett. I stumbled onto a website called Glassdoor where current and former employees could review the company anonymously. Observations about Russell Pickett himself included The CEO is skeezy as hell. Russell Pickett is a straight-up megalomaniac. I'm not saying Pickett executives make you break the law, but we do frequently hear executives start sentences with, I'm not saying you should break the law, but so that's the kind of guy Pickett was. And although he'd gotten around all the lawsuits by settling them, the criminal investigation wouldn't go away. From what I could gather, the company had bribed a bunch of state officials in exchange for contracts to build a better sewer overflow system in Indianapolis. Fifteen years ago, the government had set aside all this money to clean up the White River by building more sewage retention pools and expanding this tunnel system that runs underneath downtown, diverting a creek called Pogues Run. The idea was that within a decade, the sewers would stop dumping into the river every time it rained. Pickett Engineering had gotten the initial contract, but they'd never finished the work, and it had gone way over budget so the government pulled the contract from Pickett's company and allowed anyone to bid on finishing the project. And then, even though they'd done a terrible job the first time, Pickett Engineering won the new contract, apparently by bribing state officials. Two of Pickett's executives had already been arrested and were believed to be cooperating with the police. Pickett himself hadn't yet been charged although an editorial in the paper from three days before his disappearance criticized the authorities. The Indianapolis Star has enough evidence to indict Russell Pickett. Why don't the authorities? An NNDDD it's happening. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Just waiting for the zip to download. Yes, and opening, and. Oh, hell yes. Daisy finally looked up at me and smiled. Her front teeth were a little crooked, turning toward each other, and she was self-conscious about it, so she rarely smiled all the way. But now I could even see her gums. Can I do the thing, like, at the end of Scooby-Doo and tell you how I did it? I nodded. So the first article about Pickett's disappearance refers to a police report obtained by the Indianapolis Star. That story was written by Sandra Oliveros, with additional reporting by this dude Adam Bitterly, which is a bummer of a last name, but anyway, he's clearly the junior guy on the story, and a quick Google shows him to be a recent IU grad. 
so I made up an email address that looks almost exactly like Sandra Oliveros's and emailed bitterly in order to send me a copy of the police report. And he replied, like, I can't. I don't have it on my home computer, so I told him to go the hell into the office and email it to me. And he was like, it's Friday night. And I was, like, I know it's Friday night, but the news doesn't stop breaking on the weekend. Do your job, or I'll find someone else who will do it. And then he went to the fucking office and emailed me scans of the fucking police report. Jesus. Welcome to the future, Holmesy. It's not about hacking computers anymore, it's about hacking human souls. The file is in your email. Sometimes I wondered if Daisy was my friend only because she needed a witness. As the file downloaded, I glanced away from my screen, through the slits of the blinds to the parking lot outside. A streetlight was shining right at us, which made everything around it look pitch black. I was trying to shake off a thought, but as I opened the police report and began scanning through it, the thought grew. What? Daisy asked. Nothing, I said, and tried again to swallow the thought. But I couldn't. Just, won't he get in trouble? Like, when he goes into work on Monday, won't he ask his boss why she needed that file, and then won't she be, like, what file, and then won't he get in trouble? Like, he could get fired. Daisy just rolled her eyes, but I was in the spiral now, and I started to worry that Mr. Bitterly would figure out how to track down Daisy, that he would have her arrested, and maybe me, too, since I was probably an accomplice. We were just playing a silly game, but people go to prison all the time for lesser crimes. I imagined a news story, girl hackers obsessed with billionaire boy. He'll find us, I said after a while. Who? She asked. The guy, I said. Bitterly. No, he won't. I'm on public Wi-Fi in an Applebee's using an IP address that locates me in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. And if he does find me, I'll say you had no idea what I was doing, and I'll go to prison for you and in thanks for my refusal to snitch, you'll get my face tattooed on your bicep. It'll be great. Daisy, be serious. I am being serious. Your skinny little bicep needs a tattoo of my face. Also, he's not going to get fired. He's not going to find us. At most, he will learn an important lesson about fishing in a way that's minimally harmful to his life and the company he works for. Calm down, all right? I gotta get back to this very important argument I'm having with a stranger on the internet about whether Chewbacca is a person. Holly came by with the check, an unsubtle reminder that we'd overstayed our welcome. I put down the debit card mom had given me. Daisy never had any money and my mom let me charge $25 a week as long as I kept straight as. Beneath the table, I rubbed my thumb against the callus of my finger. I told myself that Daisy was probably right, that everything would probably be fine. Probably. Daisy didn't look up from her phone, but said, Seriously, Holmesy. I won't let anything happen. I promise. You can't control it, that's the thing, I said. Life is not something you wield, you know? Hell yes, it is, she mumbled, still sunk into her phone. Ah, God, now this guy is saying I write bestiality. Wait, what? Because in my FIC, Chewbacca and Ray were in love. He's saying it is, and I am quoting, criminal, because it's interspecies romance. Not sex, even, I keep it rated teen for the kids out there, just love. But Chewbacca isn't human, I said. 
It's not a question of whether Chewy was human, Holmesy. It's a question of whether he was a person. She was almost shouting. She took Star Wars stuff quite seriously. And he was obviously a person. Like, what even makes you a person? He had a body and a soul and feelings, and he spoke a language, and he was an adult, and if he and Ray were in hot, hairy, communicative love, then let's just thank God that two consenting, sentient adults found each other in a dark and broken galaxy. So often, nothing could deliver me from fear, but then sometimes, just listening to Daisy did the trick. She'd straighten something inside me, and I no longer felt like I was in a whirlpool or walking an ever-tightening spiral. I didn't need similes. I was located in myself again. So he's a person because he's sentient? Nobody complains about male humans hooking up with female Twi'leks. Because of course men can choose whatever they want to bone. But a human woman falling in love with a Wookiee, God forbid. I mean, I know I'm just feeding the trolls here, Holmesy, but I can't stand for it. I just mean, like, a baby isn't sentient, but a baby is still a person. Nobody is saying anything about babies, Holmesy. This is about one adult person who happened to be human falling in love with another adult person who happened to be a Wookiee. Can Ray even speak Wookiee? You know, it's a little annoying that you don't read my fanfic, but what's really annoying is that you don't read any Chewy fanfic. If you did, you'd know that Wookiee was not a language, it was a species. There were at least three Wookiee languages. Ray learned Shiriwook from Wookiees who came to Jakku, but she didn't usually speak it because Wookiees mostly understood basic. I was laughing. And why are you using the past tense? Because all of this happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, Holmesy. You always use the past tense when talking about Star Wars. Duh. Wait, can humans speak Shiri, the Wookiee language? Daisy did a very passable Chewbacca impersonation in response then translated herself. That was me asking if you're gonna eat your fries. I passed the to-go carton across the table to her, and she took a handful, then made another Chewbacca noise with her mouth half full. What did that mean? I asked her. It's been over 24 hours, time to text Davis. Wookiees have texting? Had texting, she corrected me. 7. Monday morning, I drove mom to school because her car was in the shop. I could feel the burning in my middle finger from the hand sanitizer I'd applied just before leaving, and so I was pressing the band-aid into my middle finger, simultaneously worsening and relieving the pain. I hadn't texted Davis over the weekend. I kept thinking about it. But the night at Applebee's passed, and then I'd started to feel nervous about it, like maybe it had been too long, and Daisy wasn't around to bully me into it because she was working all weekend. Mom must have noticed the band aid pressing, because she said, You have an appointment with Dr. Singh tomorrow, don't you? Yeah. What are your thoughts on the med situation? It's okay. I guess, which wasn't quite the whole truth. For one thing, I wasn't convinced the circular white pill was doing anything when I did take it, and for another, I was not taking it quite as often as I was technically supposed to. Partly, I kept forgetting, but also there was something else I couldn't quite identify, some way down fear that taking a pill to become myself was wrong. You there? Mom asked. Yeah, I said. Enough of me, but only just enough, was still located inside Harold to hear her voice, to follow the well-worn path to school. Just be honest with Dr. Singh, okay? There's no need to suffer. 
which I'd argue is just a fundamental misunderstanding of the human predicament, but okay. I parked in the student parking lot, parted ways with mom, and then lined up to walk through the metal detectors. Once declared weapon-free, I joined the flow of bodies filling the hallways like blood cells in a vein. I made it to my locker a few minutes early and took a second to look up the reporter Daisy had fished, Adam bitterly. He'd shared a link that morning to a new story he'd written about a school board voting to ban some book, so I guessed he hadn't been fired. Daisy was right, nothing happened. I was about to head toward class when Michael jogged up to my locker and pulled me over to a bench. How's it going, Aza? Good, I said. I was thinking about how part of yourself can be in a place while at the same time the most important parts are in a different place, a place that can't be accessed via your senses. Like, how I'd driven all the way to school without really being inside the car. I was trying to look at Michael, trying to hear the clamor of the hallway, but I wasn't there, not really, not deep down. Um, he said. So, listen, I don't want to mess up our friend group, because it's really great, but, this is awkward, but do you think, and seriously you can say no? He trailed off, but I could see where he was going. I don't really think I can date anyone right now, I said. I'm, like. He cut in. Well, now it's super awkward. I was gonna ask if you think Daisy would go out with me, or if that's crazy. I mean, you're great, Aza. I knew Michael well enough not to actually die of mortification, but only just. Yes, I said. Yes. That is a great idea. But you should just talk to her about it, not me. But yes. By all means, ask her out. I am embarrassed. This has been an embarrassment. You should ask out Daisy. I am going to stand up and exit the conversation now with whatever self-respect I still have. I'm really sorry, he said as I stood up and backed away. I mean, you're beautiful, Aza. It's not that. No, I said. No. Say nothing more. It's definitely my bad. I'm just. I'm gonna go now. Do ask out Daisy. Mercifully, a beep rang out from above, allowing me to scamper off to biology class. Our teacher was late, so everyone was talking. I hunched down in my seat and immediately texted Daisy. Me. I thought Michael was asking me out so I tried to let him down easy but he was not asking me out. He was asking me if I would ask you out for him. Humiliation level, all time high. But you should say yes. He's cute. Her. Oh God. Panic. He looks like a giant baby. Me. What? Her. He looks like a giant baby. Molly Krause said that once and I've never been able to unsee it. I can't hook up with a giant baby. Me. Because of the shaved head? Her. Because of the everything homesy. Because he looks exactly like a giant baby. Me. He really doesn't. Her. Next time you see him look at him and tell me he does not look like a giant baby. He looks exactly like if Drake and Beyonce had a giant baby. Me. That would be a hot giant baby. Her. I'm saving that text in case I ever need to blackmail you. By the way have you looked at the police report? Me. Not really, have you? Her. 
Yes, even though I had to close yesterday and Saturday and I had this calc stuff that is like reading Sanskrit and I had to wear the Chucky costume like 12 separate times. I didn't find any clues, but I did read the whole thing. Even though it's super boring. I really am the unsung hero of this investigation. Me. I think you are fairly sung. I'll read it today I gotta go Ms. Park is looking at me weird. Throughout bio, each time Ms. Park turned to the blackboard, I read the missing persons report from my phone. The report went on only for a few pages, and over the course of the school day, I was able to read all of it. The MP, missing person, was 53, male, gray-haired, blue-eyed, with a tattoo reading No Light Te Bastardes Carborundorum. Don't let the bastards get you down. Apparently, on his left shoulder blade, three small surgical scars in his abdomen from a gallbladder removal, six feet in height approximately 220 pounds, last seen wearing his standard sleeping attire, a horizontally striped navy and white nightshirt and light blue boxer shorts. He was discovered missing at 5.35 a.m. when the police raided his house in connection with a corruption investigation. The report was mostly witness statements from witnesses who had not witnessed anything. Nobody was there that night except Noah and Davis. The camera at the front entrance had captured two groundskeepers driving away at 5.40 p.m. Malik the zoologist left that day at 5.52. Lyle left at 6.02, and Rosa at 6.04. So what Lyle told us about Pickett not having nighttime staff seemed true. One page was devoted to Davis's witness summary. Rosa left pizza for us. Noah and I ate while playing a video game together. Dad came down for a few minutes and sat with us while he ate pizza, and then went back upstairs. There was nothing unusual. Most nights I only see Dad for a few minutes, or not at all. He didn't seem anxious. It was just a regular day. After Noah and I finished dinner, we put our dishes in the sink. I helped him with some homework and then read on the couch for school while he played a video game. I went upstairs around 10, did some homework in my room, and looked at a couple stars with my telescope, Vega and Epsilon Lyrae. I went to bed around 11 p.m. even looking back, there was nothing weird about that day. Witness also stated that he did not observe anything unusual via the telescope, adding, my kind of telescope isn't for looking at the ground. You'd be seeing everything upside down and backward. No statement came next. I played Battlefront for a while with Davis. We had pizza for dinner. Dad was with us for a bit, talked about how the Cubs are doing. He told Davis he needed to do a better job of watching out for me, and then Davis was, like, I'm not his father. He and Dad were always sniping like that, though. Dad put a hand on my shoulder when he got up to leave, which felt a little weird. I could really feel him holding on to my shoulder. It almost hurt. Then he let go and headed upstairs. Davis helped me with my algebra homework and then I played Battlefront for another couple hours. I went upstairs around midnight and fell asleep. I didn't see Dad after he said goodnight. There were also pictures, almost a hundred of them, of every room in the house. Nothing appeared disrupted. In Pickett's office, I saw stacks of papers that seemed to have been left for an evening not for a lifetime. A cell phone could be seen on his bedside table. The carpets were so clean I could see a single set of footprints leading to Pickett's desk, and a single set leading away from them. The closets were full of suits, dozens of them perfectly aligned from lightest gray to darkest black. A photograph of the kitchen sink showed three dirty dishes, 
each with little smudges of pizza grease and tomato sauce. To judge from the pictures, Pickett didn't seem to be missing so much as he seemed to have been raptured. The report did not, however, contain any mention of the night vision photograph, meaning we had something the cops didn't, a timeline. After school, I got into Harold and screamed when Daisy suddenly appeared in the back seat. Shit, you scared me. Sorry, she said. I've been hiding, because Michael and I are in the same history class, and I don't want to deal with it yet, and also I've got a bunch of comments to reply to. It's a hard life for a minor fan fiction author. Did you notice anything in the police report? I was still catching my breath, but eventually said, they seem to know slightly less than we do. Yeah, Daisy said. Wait. Holmesy, that's it. That's it. They know slightly less than we do. Um, so? The reward is for information leading to the whereabouts of Russell Davis Pickett. We may not know where he is but we have information they don't that will help them find his whereabouts. Or not, I said. We should call. We should call and be, like, hypothetically, if we knew where Pickett was the night he disappeared, how much would that be worth? Maybe not the full hundred thousand, but something. Let me talk to Davis about it, I said. I worried about betraying him even though I barely knew him. Break hearts, not promises, Holmesy. Just. I mean, who knows if they'd even give us money for that, you know? It's just a picture. You need a ride to work? As it happens, I do. While eating dinner with Mom in front of the TV that night, I kept thinking about the case. What if they did give us a reward? It was valuable information the police didn't have. Maybe Davis would hate me, if he ever found out, but why should I care what some kid from Sad Camp thought of me? After a while, I begged homework and escaped to my room. I thought maybe I'd missed something from the police report. So I went through it again and was still reading when Daisy called me. She started talking before I'd finished saying, Hi. I had a highly hypothetical conversation with the tip line, and they said that the reward is coming from the company, not the police, so it's up to the company to decide what is relevant, and that the reward would only be given out after they found Pickett. Our info is definitely relevant, but it's not like they'll find Pickett just with the night vision picture, so we might have to split the reward with other people. Or if they never find him, we might not get it. Still, better than nothing. Or exactly equal to nothing, if they don't find him. Yeah, but it's evidence. We should at least get part of the reward. If they find him. Crook gets caught. We get paid. I don't see why you're waffling here, Holmesy. Just then, my phone buzzed. I have to go, I said, and hung up. I'd gotten a text from Davis. I used to think you should never be friends with anyone who just wants to be near your money or your access or whatever. I started typing a response, but then another text came in. Like, never make a friend who doesn't like you. I started to type again, but saw the That meant he was still typing, so I stopped and waited. But maybe the money is just part of me. Maybe that's who I am. A moment later, he added, What's the difference between who you are and what you have? Maybe nothing. At this point I don't care why someone likes me. I'm just so goddamned lonely. I know that's pathetic. But yeah. I'm lying in a sand trap of my dad's golf course looking at the sky.
I had kind of a shitty day. Sorry for all these texts. I got under the covers and wrote him back. Hi. Him. I told you I was bad at chit chat. Right. That's how you start a conversation. Hi. Me. You're not your money. Him. Then what am I? What is anyone? Me. I is the hardest word to define. Him. Maybe you are what you can't not be. Me. Maybe. How's the sky? Him. Great. Huge. Amazing. Me. I like being outside at night. It gives me this weird feeling, like I'm homesick but not for home. It's kind of a good feeling, though. Him. I am drenched in that feeling at the moment. Are you outside? Me. I'm in bed. Him. Light pollution makes naked eye stargazing suck here, but I can see all eight stars in the Big Dipper right now, if you include Alcor. Me. What was shitty about your day? I watched the and waited. He wrote for a long time, and I imagined him typing and deleting, typing and deleting. Him. I'm all alone out here, I guess. Me. What about Noah? Him. He's all alone, too. That's the worst part. I don't know how to talk to him. I don't know how to make it stop hurting. He's not doing any homework. I can't even get him to take a shower regularly. Like, he's not a little kid. I can't make him do stuff. Me. If I knew something, like, something about your dad? And I told, would that make it better or worse? He was typing for a long time. Much worse, came the reply at last. Me. Why? Him. Two reasons. If Noah can be 18 or 16 or even 14 when he has to watch his father go to jail, that will be better than it happening when he's 13. Also, if Dad gets caught because he tries to contact us, that will be okay. But if he gets caught despite not reaching out to us, Noah will be completely crushed. He still thinks our dad loves us and all that. For a moment, and only for a moment, I entertain the notion that Davis might have helped his father disappear. But I couldn't see Davis as his father's accomplice. Me. I'm sorry. I won't say anything. Don't worry. Him. Today is our mom's birthday, but Noah barely knew her. It's all just so different for him. Me. Sorry. Him. And the thing is, when you lose someone, you realize you'll eventually lose everyone. Me. True. And once you know that, you can never forget it. Him. Clouds are blowing in. I should go to bed. Good night, Aza. Me. Good night. I put the phone on my bedside table and pulled my blanket up over me, thinking about the big sky over Davis and the weight of the covers on me, thinking about his father and mine. Davis was right. Everybody disappears eventually. 8. Daisy was standing next to my parking spot when Harold and I arrived at school the next morning. Summer doesn't last in Indianapolis, and even though it was still September, Daisy was underdressed for the weather in a short sleeve top and skirt. I have a crisis, she announced once I was out of the car. As we walked through the parking lot, she explained. So last night, Michael called to ask me out, and I could have handled myself via text but you know I get nervous on the phone, plus I remain unsure Michael can handle all. This, she said, gesturing vaguely at herself. 
I am willing to give the giant baby a chance. But in a flustered moment, not wanting to commit to a full on proper date, I may have suggested he and I go on a double date with you and Davis. You did not, I said. And then he was, like, Aza said she wasn't looking for a relationship, and I was, like, well, she already has a crush on this dude who goes to Aspen Hall, and then he was, like, the billionaire's kid, and I was, like, yeah, and then he was, like, I can't believe I got fake rejected by someone for a fake reason. But anyway, on Friday night, you and me and Davis and a man-sized baby are having a picnic. A picnic? Yeah, it'll be great. I don't like eating outside, I said. Why can't we just go to Applebee's and use two coupons instead of one? She stopped and turned to me. We were on the steps outside school, people all around us, and I worried we might get trampled, but Daisy had the ability to part seas. People made room for her. Let me list my concerns here, she said. 1. I don't want to be alone with Michael on our first and probably only date. 2. I have already told him you have a crush on a guy from Aspen Hall. I can't unsay that. 3. I have not actually made out with a human being in months. 4. Therefore, I am nervous about the whole thing and want my best friend there. You will note that nowhere in my top four concerns is whether we picnic, so if you want to move this mofo to Applebee's, that is okay by me. I thought about it for a second. I'll try, I said. So I texted Davis while waiting for the second bell to ring and commence biology. Couple friends are getting dinner at Applebee's at 86th and Ditch on Friday. Are you free? He wrote back immediately. I am. Pick you up or meet you there. Meet us there. Does seven work? Sure. See you then. After school that day, I had an appointment with Dr. Singh in her windowless office in the immense Indiana University North Hospital up in Carmel. Mom offered to drive me but I wanted some time alone with Harold. The whole way up, I thought about what I'd say to Dr. Singh. I can't properly think and listen to the radio at the same time, so it was quiet in the car, except for the thumping rumble of Harold's mechanical heart. I wanted to tell her that I was getting better, because that was supposed to be the narrative of illness. It was a hurdle you jumped over, or a battle you won. Illness is a story told in the past tense. How are you? She asked as I sat down. The walls in Dr. Singh's office were bare except for this one small picture of a fisherman standing on a beach with a net slung over his shoulder. It looked like stock photography, like the picture that came free with the frame. She didn't even have any diplomas up on the wall. I feel like I might not be driving the bus of my consciousness, I said. Not in control, she said. I guess. Her legs were crossed, and her left foot was tapping the ground like it was trying to send a Morse code SOS. Dr. Karen Singh was in constant motion, like a badly drawn cartoon, but she had the single greatest resting poker face I'd ever seen. She never betrayed disgust or surprise. I remember when I told her that I sometimes imagine ripping my middle finger off and stomping on it, she said, because your pain has a locus there, and I said, maybe, and she shrugged and said, that's not uncommon. Has there been an uptick in your rumination or intrusive thoughts? I don't know. They continue to intrude. When did you put that band-aid on? I don't know, I lied. She stared at me, unblinking. After lunch. And with your fear of C. diff? I don't know. Sometimes it happens. 
Do you feel that you're able to resist the... No, I said. I mean, I'm still crazy, if that's what you're asking. There has been no change on the being crazy front. I've noticed you use that word a lot, crazy. And you sound angry when you say it, almost like you're calling yourself a name. Well, everyone's crazy these days, Dr. Singh. Adolescent sanity is so 20th century. It sounds to me like you're being cruel to yourself. After a moment, I said, how can you be anything to yourself? I mean, if you can be something to yourself, then yourself isn't, like, singular. You're deflecting. I just stared at her. You're right that self isn't simple, Aza. Maybe it's not even singular. Self is a plurality, but pluralities can also be integrated, right? Think of a rainbow. It's one arc of light but also seven differently colored arcs of light. Okay, well, I feel more like seven things than one thing. Do you feel like your thought patterns are impeding your daily life? Ah, yeah, I said. Can you give me an example? I don't know, like, I'll be at the cafeteria and I'll start thinking about how, like, there are all these things living inside of me that eat my food for me, and how I sort of am them, in a way, like, I'm not a human person so much as this disgusting, teeming blob of bacteria, and there's not really any getting myself clean, you know, because the dirtiness goes all the way through me. Like, I can't find the deep down part of me that's pure or unsullied or whatever, the part of me where my soul is supposed to be. Which means that I have maybe, like, no more of a soul than the bacteria do. That's not uncommon, she said. Her catchphrase. Dr. Singh then asked if I was willing to try exposure response therapy again, which I'd done back when I first started seeing her. Basically I had to do stuff like touch my calloused finger against a dirty surface and then not clean it or put a band-aid on. It had sort of worked for a while, but now all I could remember was how scared it had made me, and I couldn't bear the thought of being that scared again, so I just shook my head no at the mention of it. Are you taking your Lexapro? She asked. Yeah, I said. She just stared at me. It freaks me out some to take it, so not every day. Freaks you out? I don't know. She kept watching me, her foot tapping. The air felt dead in the room. If taking a pill makes you different, like, if it changes the way down you. That's just a screwed up idea, you know? Who's deciding what me means, me or the employees of the factory that makes Lexapro? It's like I have this demon inside of me, and I want it gone but the idea of removing it via pill is. I don't know. Weird. But a lot of days I get over that, because I do really hate the demon. You often try to understand your experience through metaphor, Aza. It's like a demon inside of you. You'll call your consciousness a bus, or a prison cell, or a spiral, or a whirlpool, or a loop, or a... I think you once called it a scribbled circle, which I found interesting. Yeah, I said. One of the challenges with pain, physical or psychic, is that we can really only approach it through metaphor. It can't be represented the way a table or a body can. In some ways, pain is the opposite of language. She turned to her computer, shook her mouse to wake it up and then clicked an image on her desktop. I want to share something Virginia Woolf wrote. English, which can express the thoughts of Hamlet and the tragedy of Lear, has no words for the shiver and the headache. The merest schoolgirl, when she falls in love, has Shakespeare or Keats to speak her mind for her. But let a sufferer try to describe a pain in his head to a doctor and language at once runs dry.
and were such language-based creatures that to some extent we cannot know what we cannot name. And so we assume it isn't real. We refer to it with catch-all terms, like crazy or chronic pain, terms that both ostracize and minimize. The term chronic pain captures nothing of the grinding, constant, ceaseless, inescapable hurt. And the term crazy arrives at us with none of the terror and worry you live with. Nor do either of those terms connote the courage people in such pains exemplify, which is why I'd ask you to frame your mental health around a word other than crazy. Yeah, I said. Can you say that? Can you say that you're courageous? I screwed up my face at her. Don't make me do that therapy stuff, I said. That therapy stuff works. I am a brave warrior in my internal battle of Valhalla, I deadpanned. She almost smiled. Let's talk about a plan to take that medication every single day, she said, and then proceeded to talk about mornings versus evenings, and how we could also try to get off the medication and try a different one, but that might be best attempted during a less stressful period, like summer vacation, and on and on. Meanwhile, for some reason I felt a twinge in my stomach. Probably just nerves from listening to Dr. Singh talk about dosages. But that's also how C. diff starts. Your stomach hurts because a few bad bacteria have managed to take hold in your small intestine, and then your gut ruptures and 72 hours later you're dead. I needed to reread that case study of the woman who had no symptoms except a stomachache and turned out to have C. diff. Can't get out my phone right now, though, she'll get pissed off. But did that woman have some other symptom at least, or am I exactly like her? Another twinge. Did she have a fever? Couldn't remember. Shit. It's happening. You're sweating now. She can tell. Should you tell her? She's a doctor. Maybe you should tell her. My stomach hurts a little, I said. You don't have C. diff, she answered. I nodded and swallowed, then said in a small voice, I mean, you don't know that. Aza, are you having diarrhea? No. Have you recently taken antibiotics? No. Have you been hospitalized recently? No. You don't have C. diff. I nodded, but she wasn't a gastroenterologist, and anyway, I literally knew more about C. diff than she did. Almost 30% of people who died of C. diff didn't acquire it in a hospital, and over 20% didn't have diarrhea. Dr. Singh returned to the medication conversation, and as I half listened, I started thinking I might throw up. My stomach really hurt now, like it was twisting in on itself, like the trillions of bacteria within me were making room for a new species in town, the one that would rip me apart from the inside out. The sweat was pouring out of me. If I could just confirm that case study, Dr. Karen Singh saw what was happening. Should we try a breathing exercise? And so we did, inhaling deeply and then exhaling as if to flicker the candle but not extinguish it. She told me she wanted to see me in 10 days. You can kind of measure how crazy you are based on how soon they want to see you back. Last year, for a while, I'd been at 8 weeks. Now, less than two. On the walk from her office to Harold, I looked up the case report. That woman, she did have a fever. I told myself to feel relieved, and maybe I did for a little while, but by the time I got home, I could hear the whisper starting up again, that something was definitely wrong with my stomach since the gnawing ache wouldn't go away. I think, you will never be free from this. I think, you don't pick your thoughts. I think, you are dying, 
and there are bugs inside of you that will eat through your skin. I think and I think and I think. Nine. But I also had a life, a normal-ish life, which continued. For hours or days, the thoughts would leave me be, and I could remember something my mom told me once. Your now is not your forever. I went to class, got good grades, wrote papers, talked to mom after lunch, ate dinner, watched television, read. I was not always stuck inside myself, or inside myself. I wasn't only crazy. On date night, I got home from school and spent a solid two hours getting dressed. It was a cloudless day in late September, cold enough to justify a coat, but warm enough that a sleeved dress with tights could be managed. Then again, that might seem like trying, and texting Daisy was no help because she responded she was going to wear an evening gown, and I couldn't totally tell if she was kidding. In the end, I went for my favorite jeans and a hoodie over a lavender t-shirt Daisy had given me featuring Han Solo and Chewbacca in a fierce embrace. I then spent another half hour applying and unapplying makeup. I'm not the sort of person who usually gets carried away with that stuff, but I was nervous, and sometimes makeup feels kind of like armor. Are you wearing eyeliner? Mom asked when I emerged from my room. She was sorting through bills and had spread them out across the entire coffee table. The pen she held hovered over a checkbook. A little, I said. Does it look weird? Just different, Mom said, failing to disguise her disapproval. Where are you headed? Applebee's with Daisy and Davis and Michael. Back by midnight. Is this for a date? It's dinner, I said. Are you dating Davis Pickett? We are both eating dinner at the same restaurant at the same time. It's not marriage. She gestured at the spot next to her on the couch. I'm supposed to be there at 7, I said. She pointed at the couch again. I sat down, and she put her arm around me. You don't talk much to your mother. Dr. Singh told me once that if you have a perfectly tuned guitar and a perfectly tuned violin in the same room, and you pluck the D-string of the guitar, then all the way across the room, the D-string on the violin will also vibrate. I could always feel my mother's vibrating strings. I also don't talk much to other people. I want you to be careful about that Davis Pickett, okay? Wealth is careless, so around it, you must be careful. He's not wealth. He's a person. People can be careless, too. She squeezed me so tight it felt like she was pressing the breath out of me. Just be careful. I was the last to arrive and the remaining space was next to Michael, across from Davis, who was wearing a plaid button-down, nicely ironed, sleeves rolled up just so, exposing his forearms. I'm not sure why, but I've always been pretty keen on the male forearm. Cool shirt, Davis said. Birthday present from Daisy, I said. You know, some people think it's bestiality, for a Wookiee to love a human, Daisy said. Michael sighed. Don't get her started on the whole our Wookiees people thing. That's actually the most fascinating thing about Star Wars, said Davis. Michael groaned. Oh God. It's happening. Daisy immediately launched into a defense of Wookiee human love. You know. For a moment in Star Wars Apocrypha, Han was actually married to a Wookiee, but does anyone freak out about that? 
Davis was leaning forward, listening intently. He was smaller than Michael, but he took up more room. Davis's gangly limbs occupied space like an army holds territory. Davis and Daisy were chatting back and forth about the dehumanization of clone troopers, and Michael jumped in to explain that Daisy was actually kind of a famous writer of Star Wars fan fiction. Davis looked her username up on his phone and was impressed by the 2000 reads on her most recent story, and then they were all laughing about some Star Wars joke I couldn't quite follow. Waters for everyone, Daisy said when Holly arrived to take our drink order. Davis turned to me and said, they don't have Dr. Pepper? Soft drinks aren't covered by the coupon, Holly explained, monotone. But also, no. We have Pepsi. Well, I think we can spring for a round of Pepsis, he said. I realized in the silence that followed that I hadn't spoken since answering Davis's compliment about my shirt. Davis, Daisy, and Michael eventually went back to talking about Star Wars and the size of the universe and traveling faster than light. Star Wars is the American religion, Davis said at one point, and Michael said, I think religion is the American religion, and even though I laughed with them, it felt like I was watching the whole thing from somewhere else, like I was watching a movie about my life instead of living it. After a while, I heard my name and snapped into my body, seated at Applebee's, my back against the green vinyl cushion, the smell of fried food, the din of conversation pressing in from all around me. Holmesy has a Facebook, Daisy said, but her last status update is from middle school. She shot me a look that I couldn't quite interpret, and then said, Holmesy's like a grandmother when it comes to the internet. She paused again. Aren't you? She said pointedly, and then I realized at last she was trying to make room for me to talk. I use the internet. I just don't feel a need to, like, contribute to it. It does feel like the internet already contains plenty of information, Davis allowed. Wrong, Daisy said. For instance, there is very little high-quality romantic Chewbacca FIC on the internet, and I am just one person, who can only write so much. The world needs Holmesy's Wookiee love stories. There was a brief pause in the conversation. I felt my arms prickling with nervousness, sweat glands threatening to burst open. And then they went back to talking, the conversation shifting this way and that. Everyone telling stories, talking over one another, laughing. I tried to smile and shake my head at the right times, but I was always a moment behind the rest of them. They laughed because something was funny, I laughed because they had. I didn't feel hungry, but when our food arrived I picked at my veggie burger with a knife and fork to make it look like I was eating more than I could actually stomach. Eating quieted the conversation for a while, until Holly dropped off the check, which I picked up. Davis reached across the table and put his hand on top of mine. Please, he said. It is not an inconvenience to me. I let him take it. We should do something, Daisy said. I was ready to go home, eat something in private, and go to sleep. Let's go to a movie or something. We can just watch one at my house, Davis said. We get all the movies. Michael's head tilted. What do you mean you, get all the movies? I mean, we get all the movies that go to theaters. We have a screening room, and we just pay for them or whatever. I actually don't know how it works. You mean, when a movie comes out in theaters, it also comes out at your house? Yeah, Davis said. When I was a kid, we had to have a projectionist come out, but now it's all digital. 
Like, inside your house? Michael asked, still confused. Yeah, I'll show you, Davis said. Daisy looked over at me. You up for it, Holmesy? I contracted my face into a smile and nodded. I drove Harold to Davis's house. Daisy drove with Michael in his parents' minivan, and Davis led in his Escalade. Our little caravan headed west on 86th Street to Michigan Road, and then followed it down past Walmart, past the pawn shops and payday loan outfits to the gates of Davis's estate across the road from the art museum. The Pickett estate wasn't in a nice neighborhood, exactly, but it was so gigantic that it functioned as a neighborhood unto itself. The gate opened, and we followed Davis to a parking lot beside the glass mansion. The house looked even more amazing in the dark. Through the walls, I could see the whole kitchen suffused with gold light. Michael ran up to me as I exited Harold. Do you know? Oh my god, I've always wanted to see this house. This is too key and fam, you know. Who? The architect, he said. Tu Kian Pham. She's crazy famous. She's only designed three residences in the U.S. Oh my God, I can't believe I am seeing this. We followed him into the house, and Michael exclaimed a series of artist names. Pettibon. Picasso. Oh my God. That's Carrie James Marshall. I only knew who Picasso was. Yeah, I actually pressed Dad to buy that one, Davis said. Couple years ago, he took me to an art fair in Miami Beach. I really love KJM's work. I noticed Noah was lying on the same couch, playing what appeared to be the same video game. Noah, these are my friends. Friends, Noah. Sup, Noah said. Is it okay if I just, like, walk around? Michael asked. Yeah, of course. Check out the Rauschenberg combine upstairs. No way, Michael said, and charged up the stairs, Daisy trailing behind him. I found myself pulled toward the painting that Michael had called. Pettibon. It was a colorful spiral, or maybe a multicolored rose, or a whirlpool. By some trick of the curved lines, my eyes got lost in the painting so that I kept having to refocus on tiny individual pieces of it. It didn't feel like something I was looking at so much as something I was part of. I felt, and then dismissed, an urge to grab the painting off the wall and run away with it. I jumped a little when Davis placed his hand on the small of my back. Raymond Pettibon. He's most famous for his paintings of surfers, but I like his spirals. He was a punk musician before he became an artist. He was in Black Flag before it was Black Flag. I don't know what Black Flag is, I said. He pulled out his phone and tapped around a bit and then a screeching wave of sound, complete with a screaming, gravelly voice, filled the room from speakers above. That's Black Flag, he said, then used his phone to stop the music. Want to see the theater? I nodded, and he took me downstairs to the basement, except it wasn't really a basement because the ceilings were like 15 feet high. We walked down the hallway to a bookshelf lined with hardcover books. My dad's collection of first editions, he said. We're not allowed to read any of them, of course. The oil from human hands damages them. But you can take out this one, he said, and pointed at a hardcover copy of Tender as the Night. I reached for it, and the moment my hand touched the spine, the bookshelf parted in the middle and opened inward to reveal the theater, which had six stadium-style rows of black leather seats. 
by F. Scott Fitzgerald, Davis explained, whose full name was Francis Scott Key Fitzgerald. I didn't say anything. I couldn't get over the size of the movie screen. It's probably obvious how hard I'm trying to impress you, he said. Well, it's not working. I always hang out in mansions with hidden movie theaters. Want to watch something? Or we could go for a walk? There's something I want to show you outside. We shouldn't abandon Daisy and Michael. I'll let them know. He fiddled around on his phone for a second and then spoke into it. We're going for a walk. Make yourselves at home. Theaters in the basement if you're interested. A moment later, his voice began playing over the speakers, repeating what he'd just said. I could have just texted her, I said. Yeah, but that wouldn't have been as awesome. I zipped up my hoodie and followed Davis outside. We walked in silence down one of the asphalt golf paths, past the pool, which was lit from inside the water, slowly changing colors from red to orange to yellow to green. The light cast an eerie glow up onto the windows of the terrarium that reminded me of pictures of the northern lights. We kept walking until we reached one of the oblong sand bunkers of the golf course. Davis lay down inside of it, his head resting on its grassy lip. I lay down next to him, our jackets touching without our skin touching. He pointed up at the sky and said, So the light pollution is terrible, but the brightest star you see, there, see it? I nodded. That's not a star. That's Jupiter. But Jupiter is, like, depending on orbits and stuff, between 360 and 670 million miles away. Right now, it's around 500 million miles, which is around 45 light minutes. You know what light time is? Kinda, I said. It means if we were traveling at the speed of light, it would take us 45 minutes to get from Earth to Jupiter, so the Jupiter we're seeing right now is actually Jupiter 45 minutes ago. But, like, just above the trees there, those five stars that kind of make a crooked W? Quote. Yeah, I said. Right, that's Cassiopeia. And the crazy thing is, the star on the top, Calf, it's 55 light years away. Then there's Shedar, which is 230 light years away. And then Navi, which is 550 light years away. It's not only that we aren't close to them, they aren't close to one another. For all we know, Navi blew up 500 years ago. Wow, I said. So, you're looking at the past. Yeah, exactly. I felt him fumbling for something, his phone, maybe, and then glanced down and realized he was trying to hold my hand. I took it. We were quiet beneath the old light above us. I was thinking about how the sky, at least this sky, wasn't actually black. The real darkness was in the trees, which could be seen only in silhouette. The trees were shadows of themselves against the rich silver blue of the night sky. I heard him turn his head toward me and could feel him looking at me. I wondered why I wanted him to kiss me, and how to know why you want to be with someone, how to disentangle the messy knots of wanting. And I wondered why I was scared to turn my head toward him. Davis started talking about the stars again, as the night got darker. I could see more and more of them, faint and wobbly, just teetering on the edge of visibility, and he was telling me about light pollution and how I could see the stars moving if I waited long enough, and how some Greek philosopher thought the stars were pinpricks in a cosmic shroud. Then, after he fell quiet for a moment, he said, You don't talk much, Aza. 
I'm never sure what to say. He mimicked me from the day we'd met again by the pool. Try saying what you're thinking. That's something I never ever do. I told him the truth. I'm thinking about mere organism stuff. What stuff? I can't explain it, I said. Try me. I looked over at him now. Everyone always celebrates the easy attractiveness of green or blue eyes, but there was a depth to Davis's brown eyes that you just don't get from lighter colors, and the way he looked at me made me feel like there was something worthwhile in the brown of my eyes, too. I guess I just don't like having to live inside of a body? If that makes sense. And I think maybe deep down I am just an instrument that exists to turn oxygen into carbon dioxide, just like merely an organism in this vastness. And it's kind of terrifying to me that what I think of as, like, my quote unquote self isn't really under my control. Like, as I'm sure you've noticed, my hand is sweating right now, even though it's too cold for sweating, and I really hate that once I start sweating I can't stop and then I can't think about anything else except for how I'm sweating. And if you can't pick what you do or think about, then maybe you aren't really real, you know? Maybe I'm just a lie that I'm whispering to myself. I can't tell that you're sweating at all, actually. But I bet that doesn't help. Yeah, it doesn't. I took my hand from his and wiped it on my jeans then wiped my face with the sleeve of my hoodie. I disgusted myself. I was revolting, but I couldn't recoil from myself because I was stuck inside of it. I thought about how the smell of your sweat isn't from sweat itself, but from the bacteria that eat it. I started telling Davis about this weird parasite, Diplostomum pseudospathosium. It matures in the eyes of fish, but can only reproduce inside the stomach of a bird. Fish infected with immature parasites swim in deep water to make it harder for birds to spot. But then, once the parasite is ready to mate, the infected fish suddenly start swimming close to the surface. They start trying to get themselves eaten by a bird, basically, and eventually they succeed and the parasite that was authoring the story all along ends up exactly where it needs to be, in the belly of a bird. The parasite breeds there, and then baby parasites get crapped out into the water by birds, whereupon they meet with a fish, and the cycle begins anew. I was trying to explain to him why this freaked me out so much but not really succeeding, and I recognized that I'd pulled the conversation very far away from the point where we'd held hands and been close to kissing, that now I was talking about parasite-infected bird feces, which was more or less the opposite of romance, but I couldn't stop myself, because I wanted him to understand that I felt like the fish, like my whole story was written by someone else. I even told him something I'd never actually said to Daisy or Dr. Singh or anybody, that the pressing of my thumbnail against my fingertip had started off as a way of convincing myself that I was real. As a kid, my mom had told me that if you pinch yourself and don't wake up, you can be sure that you're not dreaming, and so every time I thought maybe I wasn't real, I would dig my nail into my fingertip, and I would feel the pain, and for a second I'd think, of course I'm real. But the fish can feel pain, is the thing. You can't know whether you're doing the bidding of some parasite, not really. After I said all that, we were quiet for a long time, until finally he said, my mom was in the hospital for, like, six months after her aneurysm. Did you know that? I shook my head. I guess she was kind of in a coma or whatever, like, she couldn't talk or anything, or feed herself, but sometimes if you put your hand in her hand, she would squeeze. Noah was too young to visit much, but I got to. Every single day after school, Rosa would take me to the hospital and I would lie in bed with her and we would watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on the TV in her room. Her eyes were open and everything, 
and she could breathe by herself, and I would lie there next to her and watch TMNT, and I would always have the Iron Man in my hand. My fingers squeezed into a fist around it, and I would put my fist in her hand and wait, and sometimes she would squeeze, her fist around my fist, and when it happened, it made me feel. I don't know. Loved, I guess. Anyway, I remember once Dad came, and he stood against the wall at the edge of the room like she was contagious or something. At one point, she squeezed my hand, and I told him. I told him she was holding my hand, and he said, it's just a reflex, and I said, she's holding my hand, Dad, look, and he said, she's not in there, Davis. She's not in there anymore. But that's not how it works, Aza. She was still real. She was still alive. She was as much a person as any other person. You're real, but not because of your body or because of your thoughts. Then what? I said. He sighed. I don't know. Thanks for telling me that, I said. I'd turned to him and was looking at his face in profile. Sometimes, Davis looked like a boy, pale skin, acne on his chin. But now he looked handsome. The silence between us grew uncomfortable until eventually I asked him the stupidest question, because I actually wanted to know its answer. What are you thinking? I'm thinking it's too good to be true, he said. What is? You. Oh. And then after a second, I added, nobody ever says anything is too bad to be true. I know you saw the picture. The night vision picture. I didn't answer, so he continued. That's the thing you know, that you want to tell the cops. Did they offer you a reward for it? I'm not here looking for, I said. But how can I ever know that, Aza? How will I ever know? With anyone? Did you give it to them yet? No, we won't. Daisy wants to, but I won't let her. I promise. I can't know that, he said. I keep trying to forget it, but I can't. I don't want the reward, I said, but even I didn't know if I meant it. Being vulnerable is asking to get used. That's true for anybody, though, I said. It's not even important. It's just a picture. It doesn't say anything about where he is. It gives them a time and a place. You're right, though. They won't find him. But they will ask me why I didn't turn over that picture. And they'll never believe me, because I don't have a good reason. It's just that I don't want to deal with kids at school while he's on trial. I don't want Noah to have to deal with that. I want. For everything to be like it was. And him gone is closer to that than him in jail. The truth is, he didn't tell me he was leaving. But if he had, I wouldn't have stopped him. Even if we gave them that picture, it's not like they're going to arrest you or anything. Suddenly, Davis stood up and took off across the golf course. This is a completely solvable problem, I heard him say to himself. I followed him up the walkway to the cottage, and we went inside. It was a rustic cabin with wood paneling everywhere, high ceilings, and an astonishing variety of animal heads on the walls. A plaid, overstuffed couch and matching chairs formed a semicircle facing a massive fireplace. Davis walked over to the bar area, opened the cabinet above the sink, pulled out a box of Honey Nut Cheerios, and started shaking out its contents. A few Cheerios poured out of the box into the sink, and then a bundle of bills banded with a strip of paper. 
I stepped forward and saw that the wrapping read, $10,000, which seemed impossible, because the stack was so small, a quarter inch high at the most. Another stack came out of the Cheerios box, and then another. He reached up for a box of shredded wheat puffs and repeated the process. What? What are you doing? As he grabbed a third box of cereal, he said, My dad, he hides them everywhere. These stacks. I found one inside the living room couch the other day. He hides cash like alcoholics hide vodka bottles. Davis brushed some cereal dust off the $100 bills, stacked them next to the sink, and then grabbed them. The entire stack fit in one hand. A hundred thousand dollars, he said, and offered it to me. No way, Davis. I can't. Aza, the cops found, like, two million dollars executing their warrant, but I bet they didn't even get half of it. Everywhere I look, I find these stacks, okay? Not to sound out of touch, but for my dad, this is a goddamned rounding error. It's a reward for not sharing the picture. I'll have our lawyer call you. Simon Morris. He's nice, just a little lawyery. I'm not trying. But I can't know that, he said. Please, just, if you still call or text or whatever, I'll know it's not about the reward. And you will, too. That would be a nice thing to know, even if you don't call. He walked over to a closet, opened it, stuffed the money into a blue tote bag, and offered it to me. He looked like a kid now, his watery brown eyes, the fear and fatigue in his face, like a kid waking up from a nightmare or something. I took the bag. I'll call you, I said. We'll see. I left the cabin calmly, then sprinted through the golf course, skirting the pool complex, and ran up to the mansion. I ran upstairs and walked along a hallway until I could hear Daisy talking behind a closed door. I opened it. Daisy and Michael were kissing in a large four-poster bed. Um, I said. A bit of privacy, please? Daisy asked. I closed the door, muttering, well, but it isn't your house. I didn't know where to go then. I walked back downstairs. Noah was on the couch watching TV. As I walked over to him, I noticed he was wearing actual pajamas, Captain America ones, even though he was 13. On his lap, there was a bowl of what appeared to be dry Lucky Charms. He took a handful and shoved them into his mouth. Sup, he said while chewing. His hair was greasy and matted to his forehead, and up close he looked pale, almost translucent. You doing okay, Noah? Kickin' ass and talkin' names, he said. He swallowed, and then said, So, did you find anything yet? Huh? About Dad, he said. Davis said you were after the reward. Did you find anything? Not really. Can I send you something? I took all the notes off Dad's phone from iCloud. They might help you. Might be a clue or something. The last note, the one he wrote that night, was, the jogger's mouth. That mean anything to you? I don't think so. I gave him my number so he could text me the notes and told him I'd look into it. Thanks, he said. His voice had gotten small. Davis thinks we're better off with him on the run. Says it'd be worse if he was in jail. What do you think? He stared up at me for a moment, then said, I want him to come home. 
I sat down on the couch next to him. I'm sure he'll show up. I felt him leaning over until his shoulder was against mine. I wasn't wild about touching strangers, especially given that he didn't seem to have showered in some time, but I said, it's all right to be scared, Noah. And then he turned his face away from me and started sobbing. You're okay, I told him, lying. You're okay. He'll come home. I can't think straight, he said, his little voice half strangled by the crying. Ever since he left, I can't think straight. I knew how that felt. All my life, I'd been unable to think straight, unable to even finish having a thought because my thoughts came not in lines but in knotted loops curling in upon themselves, in sinking quicksand, in light swallowing wormholes. You're okay, I lied to him again. You probably just need some rest. I didn't know what else to say. He was so small, and so alone. Will you let me know? If you find anything out about Dad, I mean. Yeah, of course. After a while, he straightened up and wiped his face against his sleeve. I told him he should get some sleep. It was nearly midnight. He put the bowl of Lucky Charms on the coffee table, stood up, and walked upstairs without saying goodbye. I didn't know where to go, and having the bag of money in my hand was freaking me out a little, so in the end I just left the house. I looked up at the sky as I ambled toward Harold, and thought about the stars in Cassiopeia, centuries of light time from me and from one another.